Welcome to an introduction to economics by David Hopcroft of Park Bench Tutors. This podcast is the first of two podcasts on utility and demand. Consumers are faced with a choice when they decide which goods to purchase. How can we study the behavior of consumers when they make a choice? Theories of consumer behavior or consumer choice are a large part of microeconomics. The studies attempt to measure the benefit in consuming a good or service. How do we try and determine what this benefit is, and if it can be measured? Then how is it to be measured? Economists make use of the idea of utility. The utility of a good or service is the benefit the consumer derives from using the good or service. In the past, the focus has been on two different approaches. A cardinalist approach assumes that the utility can be measured in numbers. The difficulty is how one determines what the units would actually be. Many economists argue that it is not possible to measure units in this way. A more favoured approach is an ordinalist approach, where the consumer ranks in terms of an order of preference, first, second, third, and so on. There are also two other methods, a revealed preference method, and now a characteristic of goods approach which is becoming more important. A cardinalist approach requires that we have a concept of marginal utility. This is the extra utility that the consumer gains or derives from consuming one more unit of that good. It also assumes that the consumption of all other goods will remain unchanged. Marginal utility per monetary unit is the extra utility that is derived by consuming one extra monetary unit of the good. An important idea for cardinalists is that of diminishing marginal utility. This can be illustrated by the chart showing marginal utility relating to quantity consumed. At first the marginal utility is high, but then it falls and may even go to a negative value. So, after an initial increase in quantity, the more of a good that is consumed, the less likely the consumer is to want further units of the good. This is known as diminishing marginal utility. Assume that there are two goods that the consumer can choose from. How do we determine when a consumer gets the maximum benefit from consuming both goods? This is where the idea of marginal utility fits in. The consumer will get the maximum benefit when the marginal utility of good X is equal to the marginal utility of good Y. Why is this the significant point? because at this point there would be no extra benefit from switching one unit of consumption of X to one unit of consumption of Y, or vice versa. We can say that the maximum marginal unit of X divided by the price of X will be equal to the maximum marginal unit of Y divided by the price of Y. Now we should consider what happens if there is a price change. For example, suppose that the price of X were to fall what would we expect to happen? If the price of Y has remained the same, then the marginal unit of X divided by the price of X will be greater than the marginal unit of Y divided by the price of Y. By consuming more units of X, the total utility will now be increased and can be increased until equality is restored. This is in line with the idea that the fall in the price of a good will lead to an increase in demand. In contrast to the cardinalist approach, we have the ordinalist approach, which ranks goods in order of preference. Ordinalists make use of the idea of indifference curves. An indifference curve will join all the different combinations of two goods, which will yield the same utility to the consumer. Let us see how this idea works. Vertical axis measures the quantity of good Y. The horizontal axis measures the quantity of good X. The consumer is said to be indifferent to the combinations represented at B and C because they are on the same curve. Because D is on a higher curve, we can say that the consumer prefers D to either B or C as a combination, and a similar argument would then apply for E. If these curves look rather like the isoquants we met earlier, then you should be aware of one big difference. An isoquant represents a given level of output whilst an indifference curve represents preferences. An isoquant is a cardinal measurement, but an indifference curve is an ordinal measurement. 
The ordinalist approach does require that some assumptions are made about the consumer. The consumer must be able to rank preferences over the entire field. The behaviour must be transitive. This means that if A is preferred to B, and if B is preferred to C, then A must also be preferred to C. It also assumes the consumer can never have all they want of all the goods, or there would be no further want. There are certain characteristics of indifference curves. The first is that they can never intersect. Indifference curves slope downwards from left to right. Note that this means as some of a good Y are given up, then more of a good X are consumed. This is represented by a movement from point A to point B. Indifference curves are convex to the origin. As more of Y is given up, then an increasing amount of X must be obtained. This idea is known as the diminishing marginal rate of substitution. The slope of the indifference curve at any point is the marginal rate of substitution. An indifference curve tells us about a consumer's preferences. How do we know which combinations are likely to be chosen? For this we need more information. We need to know about the income of our consumer and the prices of the two goods X and Y. Suppose that our consumer has an income of $100. The table now shows the combinations that the consumer can afford to buy with this income. We can plot these on a graph. The result is called a budget line. In this example, two units of Y are given up to buy each unit of X. If PX is the price of X and PY is the price of Y, then PX divided by PY is the slope of the budget line. Here we are placing the indifference map and the budget line on the same map. The significant point here is where the budget line is tangent to an indifference curve. The curve L2 represents the highest curve that can be reached. Point A is known as the consumer equilibrium point. This means the point at which the consumer will be maximizing their utility subject to budget constraint. The slope at this point, Px divided by Py, will represent the marginal rate of substitution. This ends the first podcast on utility and demand. Brought to you by Park Bench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. Thank you for watching and for listening. We wish you every success in your studies.